can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. But I'm glad to hear, like, I, I don't really approve of cards. It's one of those, it's a bit of a gateway thing, you know, can, <coughs> can, can lead to socializing and, in some cases, happiness. I was pleased to hear that Paul thrashed Dave, though, because I didn't want Dave to have that rainbow lamp. Dave's, Dave joins us. We have a, a thing called Coffee and Readings where we do a Zoom readings class every night at 7.30. And Dave comes on, and I don't know why. I think it could be because he's, his daughter-in-law is from France. But there's always pots banging around the background and noise and family wandering back and forth. And Dave is such a distraction. The last thing we needed was Dave to be playing with a rainbow. <laughs> All right. I brought my Bible today. I suggest that everyone have access to their Bible or their device so they can do some research as we go through this. So we're starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The idea is to pick up on some of the points we made yesterday and expand and extrapolate those and dig a little bit deeper. We just touched on some of these the other day and now we're going to dig a bit deeper. So we're looking at Ecclesiastes 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So this is basically the whole uh, thesis of uh, Ecclesiastes. Solomon is uh, encapsulating, or, or uh, this verse encapsulates the whole package. It's all vanity. It's all vapor. Koaleth is not a name, but a title. Uh, uh, the, the preacher is Koaleth. Translators aren't sure exactly what it means. Uh, they, they're not sure exactly who the writer of the book was. I'm convinced it was Solomon. Um, and it's not that important. What we do have is a collection of wisdom of the day. Um, I believe it was Solomon that did it because it matches some other observations that he made in other places. So um, let's assume, I'm going to say it was Solomon, whether it's uh, somebody else or not. So if we want to turn to chapter 3 and just take a look at what's going on here. <clears throat> a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Verse 4. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again, blowing toward the south and turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling along on its circular courses. The wind returns. All the rivers flow to the sea. We have this collage of, of uh, cycles, things that just uh, inevitably uh, repeat themselves. They just go around and around in circles. Generation goes, generation comes, the earth remains forever. And there's no satisfaction to this. All the rivers flow into the sea, but the seas are never full. So this idea is that there's a, there's a view, uh, an observation that Solomon makes about all of these inevitabilities, all of these cycles. And there's something big that can be drawn from these observations. And God provided all these things for us to look at. And a great philosopher, uh, but there's no, there's no, there's no end, um, there's no end point to these things. They just keep happening, and none of these things are fully satisfied. We never get to a point of equilibrium in any of these things. Once a certain uh, season has ended, the cycle begins again. It's not like, oh, we've finally reached that ultimate season. So this is part of the life that we're in. <clears throat> a great philosopher in our day, and you may recognize this, says. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no, I can't get no satisfaction. Anyway, um, I digress. So Solomon goes on to uh, pursue various things. He pursues wisdom, pleasure, legacy, accumulation of knowledge, and there's a repeated theme and a repeated conclusion to every pursuit that he, that he undertakes, and that is that it's vanity. It's a vapor. It's just a, a breeze, a wind. Verse 11 in chapter 3 says, um, he also has said eternity in their heart. 
yet so that not, a man will not find out what the work God has done from the beginning even to the end. So the idea of eternity is introduced, but the full comprehension of eternity is not available. We can understand, we can contemplate, we have the, uh, the capacity to contemplate and to think about uh, what, it's ab uh, uh, you know, what it's all about, but that's as far as it goes. We don't have the capacity to understand in reality what it, what it means. It's, it's outside of our paradigm. But look at the way it starts. It says, he has also set eternity in the heart. Also. So what's the first thing? Well, the first thing was all those inevitabilities that we just observed. All of these repeated cycles. We can see all these things happening time and time again. And we can imagine also, when we lose somebody close to us, when somebody dies an untimely death, we recognize that that's devastating to us in the moment, but life goes on. The cycles just keep going. So in addition to all that body of evidence of things we can see just by keeping our eyes open, he has also set eternity in our hearts, and we spoke to that a little bit yesterday. We can conceive of eternity, but we can't understand it. Adam Clark says this, he has set uh, the world in their heart, ha olam, that is hidden time. Well, the word olam and the word eon are, are very similar words. They're, they're words that have to do with the measurement of time. And they are really defined by the context that we find themselves in. Sometimes it means forever and ever, sometimes it means for a period of time, etc. Uh, in this case here, um, uh, this hidden time, the time beyond the present, eternity. The proper translation of this clause is the following. Also that eternity Eternity hath he placed in their heart, without which man could not find out the work which God hath made from the commencement to the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. God has deeply rooted the idea of eternity in every human heart, and every considerate man sees that all the operations of God refer to that endless duration. See verse 14. And it is only in eternity that man will be able to discover what God has designed from the various works he has formed. So I, th I, I absolutely agree with that observation that we get it, but we don't fully get it. And um, Ecclesiastes 8.17 says, I beheld the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a, man, a wise man think to know it, yet he shall not be able to find it. And this is perhaps the wisest man that ever lived, and he couldn't totally figure it out either. He just had a sense of it. This is from uh, the Infinite Book, which I'm going to be refer referring to tomorrow uh, a lot more. It, it's uh, from uh, John Barrow. It is our tendency to extrapolate from the known to the unknown and on to the unknowable by a byproduct of the mind's ceaseless attempts to correlate what we know. Or that's posed as a question. This type of search for the infinite is also closely linked to a human desire for something transcendent, something beyond what is seen and immediately experienced. Some would argue that this inclination arises because there is something transcending in our immediate experience. So uh, not only may we have been created with the uh, capacity to understand or have the world or eternity in our hearts, but we also observe things around us and by the things that we do know, um, we can extrapolate and and, and, uh, and see the rest, and imagine the rest. For example, on our way here, Sylvia and I went to Butler, Pennsylvania, to take a look at the thing where the shooter was and whatnot. There you go. You know all about my day, right? And then we came here. Well, that took about 30 seconds to tell you that. You filled in all the blanks. You know that our trip to Butler wasn't instantaneous and that our trip from Butler to here was also not instantaneous. You knew that you could imagine that we, we drove from Ontario to Butler, that we putzed around there a little bit, and that some great big security guard uttered us off the site where it said no trespassing. You could fill in all those blanks without me telling you that because that's what we do. We take our known experience and we insinuate that into what we hear and what we know, and thereby we can imagine something that has not happened and we're probably accurate much of the time. So this is the same idea that we're talking about here. He was huge. He was really big. <laughs> <clears throat> So Solomon's uh, observations about mankind in this temporal paradigm uh, were all over the place. He, in, in chapter 6, verse 3, it talks about the, the avarice of mankind. In 7.22, it talks about uh, oppression and bribery. 
in uh, 8 verse 12, a man may prolong his life by evil deeds. Uh, 9 verse 3, the hearts of men are full of evil. 9.18, destroys much good. Ignorant of the life processes. It's not very complimentary. So he's observing, making all these observations about mankind as we are uh, in, in this paradigm that we're in right now. So again, he pursued wisdom and concluded that both the wise and the foolish die. It's vanity. Pleasure, it's an empty pursuit, it's vanity. Legacy, someone else after him is going to end up with all his stuff, vanity. Accumulation of knowledge, vanity. It's all the same, it all goes to the same place. <coughs> Koleth concludes that man is compelled to seek an answer for the meaning of life. It is a task which wearies him and causes him grief and is doomed to ultimate failure. The failure of the search seems to be designed by God to bring men to a point of trust. So the point of Ecclesiastes does seem to be to lead the, the, the reader to a, a sense of hopelessness for a purpose. I think there's a constituency, or there's two constituencies that, that would have uh, read uh, uh, this collective work. It would have been non-believers and those that had some sense of belief. And it, the, the book and the conclusion is equally applicable to both. That this life is repetitive, we can imagine great things, but at the end of the day, we're not great people and it's all vanity. So you've got a choice to make. You can either enjoy the things in this world and suffice yourself with that, or you can follow God, which is what, how he ultimately concludes. But all of which he's dealing with this paradigm that we're in right now. Now, from this point forward, including tomorrow, pay attention to food. I don't, I don't have to tell anybody that here. Just pay attention to the idea of food and eating as we go forward from this point. Here's another set of conclusions that Solomon makes all the way through this. There's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. 3 verse 13, every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. Eat and drink and enjoy your work. 5.18, behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of his labor. 8 verse 15, eat and drink and be merry. 9.7, eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart. So in other words, this life is vanity. So enjoy your food, enjoy your drink, enjoy what you're doing, get what you can out of what's here. We have this in Matthew chapter 24, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Well, what's wrong with that? Eating and drinking and being married. That's what Solomon said we're supposed to do. And he knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the son, coming of the Son of Man. So there's nothing wrong with eating, there's nothing wrong with drinking, and there's nothing wrong with playing cards and being merry. But if that's all there is, if that's your entire paradigm, it's pretty lame. It's pretty weak. And if this is all we have, that's all you've got to do. So again, Solomon leads to the ultimate conclusion, that's not all we have. There's something bigger and beyond all of that. Same thing with Noah. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them all. And this is what the reference was in, in Matthew chapter 9. In Luke 12 it says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to be so all my fruits? And he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns. I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much, go much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Another very tangible example from the Gospel account that a very empty life is being described here. And again, the conclusion is, in that temporal plane, in that paradigm, eat, drink, and be merry. And Solomon again concludes, 
Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. This is a vacuous, empty life in and of itself. So there's something bigger than that. And he, at the end of the book, he tells us what it is. Okay, we've gone through this. Um, and again, just repeating uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 17, a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun because though a man labor to seek it out, he shall not find it. So although we have eternity set in our hearts, we do not have the equipment as of today to be able to, to figure things out. So I think notwithstanding the fact that some people talk about uh, Ecclesiastes as being more of a secular book or, or more of a, a book appealing to people in a secular sense, it's a deeply spiritual book and very insightful. There are a number of things that we can take from it. In 729 it says, God made man upright, which I think has a profound implication as to the difference between man and the rest of creation. Said he, uh, the world in our heart, that's huge. And this idea of eating and drinking and labor is also huge. And that's a repeated refrain that goes throughout the rest of the scriptures, the idea of tying food to our service and to our understanding of things. So there's a number of things that were alluded to in, in Ecclesiastes that point back to creation. Um, and, and, and we're going to make a shift now. That, that Solomon described what we are now, and now we're going to go back and look at where we were in more detail and how we got from where we were to where we are and what the ultimate ramifications of that is. And the Lord God, in Genesis 2.15, took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou may not eat of it, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So man was created upright, he had work, there was food involved, and he had eternity in his heart. And he was given a very simple task. Just live and eat whatever you want, except that tree. What was the tree of life for Adam? Every tree was the tree of life for Adam. There was only one tree that was the tree of death. <clears throat> so Adam was in a undefined Olam. There was no, and there's no indication in this story that he would have died any other way had he not disobeyed. Everything was predicated on his obedience. Everything changed on his disobedience. So as long as there was no disobedience, his Olam was without definition and without confinement. There's nothing that says he would have not lived forever. Solomon also recognizes the reality of human nature and how God had satisfied it in the original creation. He says in, in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one. And in 9, verse 9, live joyfully with the, uh, the wife with whom thou lovest all the days of thy life. And we know that God created woman to be with man. So man's need for companionship. Man's inclination toward evil is set out repeatedly in Ecclesiastes. It's sought out many inventions. Uh, the heart of the sons of men is fully set to do evil. And then we know in uh, Genesis 3 verse 1 uh, that uh, th 3 verse 1 through that they sinned, that man sinned. So, and at that point, from that point forward, man's inclination was to be uh, uh, evil or carnal. And there was a life of toil. We know that uh, uh, Solomon spoke extensively about toil and enjoying the fruits of your labor. And he, he said, do the best you can, enjoy that. That's, that's actually a blessing. And I think it was a blessing initially for Adam and Eve as well. They had something to do in the garden. They were to tend the garden, but they didn't have all the weeds and all the bad stuff to tend. But there was something to keep Adam busy and give him some kind of satisfaction. So there's a life of toil that was uh, uh, accounted for in the, in, the, uh, in the creation. And then the inevitability of death, which ultimately came as a result of what Adam did. So, we quick, quickly blasted through that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In what beginning? Hang on a minute. This is about eternity. How can there be a beginning if there's eternity? So, when we look at in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, we have to conclude that's our beginning. That's the beginning that is relevant to our thinking and our paradigm. 
because if eternity if eternity is eternal there's no beginning so this is our beginning so eternity and temporality and temporality coexist like duh it's it's a very easy observation to make but it's not something it's not where we normally think we think of we think of temporality as something where we start someplace and we end up some other place that's our that's our frame of reference but if eternity is eternal then temporality exists within eternity so they coexist they they operate at the same time so this is how i think we tend to look at uh, our life you know we're born the kid's bald. We go through life and we end up dead at the end of it. So we see a timeline. We see it as a linear thing, right? And even when we think of eternity, don't we think of that as something that's going to happen later for us? So that's what this is about. So this is where we want to start expanding our mind in how we view eternity and temporality and the coexistence of them. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We know that heaven, we think of heaven as being something upward. I think we should definitely do that, but it's something outward. It's something beyond our experience. It's, it's, it's everywhere that we aren't. It's beyond the temporal. So we have the heaven on one side, we have the earth on the other side. And there's this, there's this dichotomy that presents itself through the scriptures, that there are these two things, one on the eternal plane and one on the, on the temporal plane. And the object of this, uh, of this study is to try and figure out what it is we can do in this temporal plane to break out of this temporal paradigm, because we don't belong here. We, in in this room should not, um, we have to live in it, but we don't have to be part of it. And that's where this ultimately goes. Image and likeness is, and this is the work of uh, John Thomas. In our image, the Hebrew word for image is uh, tselem, which means bodily shape or form. And after our likeness is the Hebrew word um, demuth, which means a mental constitution or capacity. And he says, while image then has reference to form or shape, likeness has regard to mental constitution. In form and capacity, he was made like to the angels, though in nature he was inferior to them. I happen to agree with uh, John Thomas on this and, and all of these points that he's making. When God created man, he made him after his own image. This image may have consisted partly in a physical resemblance, uh, since when angels appear in scripture, they always look like men, but more importantly, uh, but more important is the intellectual and moral resemblance. God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. The knowledge accessible to the mind of man and comprehensible by him was strictly limited. It is remarked upon by Zophar. Canst thou by searching out God find him? Canst thou find out the Almighty to perfection? It is as the high as the heavens, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? He hath made everything beautiful in this time, and we've, we've, we've covered this in, in Ecclesiastes. So again, this idea of uh, getting a sense for things but not fully understanding it. Now here's a different idea about the manner in which man was originally created, and I only do this by way of quick contrast. This fellow Eaton says this, the blame for the variety of wisdom is attributed to no one but mankind himself. He was created neither sinful nor neutral. And that's the part I disagree with, and I put this out here just to give you another thought to contemplate. But upright, a word that uses, uh, that uses uh, of the state of heart which is disposed to faithfulness and obedience. And the flaw in this fellow's thinking, I believe, is this, that he uses our current parad paradigm to try and explain what upright was in a different paradigm. So he goes to Kings and Psalms and says, this is what upright means in the context of our current paradigm. He says, and then he takes that definition and says, okay, that's what it must have meant before our current paradigm came about. So I think that's why this is flawed. And I think I uh, think Christadelphians have this quite right. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas goes on to say, the spirit in David testified in Psalm, some Roman numeral thing, um, that f flesh is spirit uh, that passed away and cometh not again. The common version says flesh is a wind, but in the Hebrew, the word is ruach, which in Genesis uh, is translated spirit. If we are to believe the word, flesh then is spirit. 
But if you and I and all mankind and other beasts in general be spirit, what is the most obvious difference in view of the divine testimony between men and angels, who are incompatible and deathless? Men and angels are both spirit in a certain sense, for in scripture they are both spirits, only one class a little lower than the other. What then is the most obvious or striking difference between the two kinds of spirit or nature, the human and angelic? It is this, human nature in general is spirit that passes the way and cometh not again, while angelic or divine uh, uh, nature or substance is spirit that doth not pass away and is therefore inc incorruptible and immortal. So there's this um, idea that all flesh is spirit. Anything that has God, God's breath in it, or the, 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 the wind, the, the ruach the, uh, of God is, is spirit, or it's a container of spirit. Now, I, I don't entirely agree with the conclusion that uh, there's an equivalence between flesh and spirit. I, I see flesh as uh, being the, the habitation of spirit, um, but not in the, in the Holy Spirit, um, not in the immortal soul kind of way. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Uh, we, we can only touch on it in this, in this text here. So, um, spirits of all flesh, man and animals, each, a, each animal was created. This is postulated by uh, Brother Al Walker, anyone who knows him, uh, remembers him. Each animal was created by God to perpetuate eternally after its kind, which I thought is kind of a, a neat idea. So again, it's the idea that each entity that has had the breath of life, the breath of God, uh, is spirit or contains spirit. All right, I got to catch up to where my slides are here. I didn't know if I wanted to bring this slide up or not, but it, for these purposes, it works. This is the statements of faith. Um, I'll just read the black part. That the first uh, man was Adam, whom God created out of the dust of the ground as a living soul or natural body of life, very good in kind and condition, and he was placed under a law through which the continuance of life was contingent on obedience. Adam broke this law and was sentenced to return to the ground from whence he was taken, a sentence which in effect defiled and became a physical law of his being and was transmitted to all his posterity. Um, that God, in his kindness, conceived a plan of restoration which, without setting aside his just and necessary law of sin and death, could ultimately rescue the obedient of the race from destruction and people of the earth with sinless immortals. So it's a good uh, three clauses that deal with uh, the beginning of man, what man did, and the result, and the fact that God solved our problem for us. So I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. So when we look carefully at the creation account, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Number one. So there's a carcass lying there that was out of the dust of the ground. And then into that carcass, God breathed the breath of life. So there's a two-step process. He did, didn't throw breath of life at the dust. He created man, and then he uh, gave him the breath of life. So Adam was created in an eternal paradigm. The environment, or an in internal environment, the environment that he was created into, there's no indication in this story that it was going to be anything but eternal. That's the environment that he was created in. It was communion in harmony. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 27, it interestingly says, I think it's verse 27, and it seems to just jump off the page as being irrelevant to everything else. It goes through, no, there's not, it's not verse 27, that doesn't exist. It's verse 25. So we have this whole story about how man was created and how the, how the whole creation was put together. And then out of nowhere, it says, and man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. What's that got to do with anything? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything. But I think what it tells us, because of the rest of the story and how it unfolds, is the fact that in the initial period, there was communion and harmony, and flesh and blood were in the kingdom of God. 
And whereas today, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There's a problem that got created as a result of this story. But in the initial period, um, God and, uh, and, and Adam and Eve were consorting with each other and were in fellowship with each other and being naked was irrelevant. It wasn't a factor. There was no shame associated with it or anything else. It wasn't until after they partook of the fruit that that cascade of events started to take place and Adam felt shame and they tried to cover themselves up and God certainly agreed that was a situation that needed to be resolved. All right, so I'm going to skip down to this fellow again. Aside from the fact that he's got clothing, because this is a general a PG audience, um, this is how I see Adam's uh, initial situation, that he, he wasn't predisposed to one inclination or the other. He didn't have a particular spirituality about him, although there was, uh, he was consorting with the Elohim. There's no indication that there was worship going on and there was a, any proclivity to do that kind of thing, nor was there a bias inherently to be carnal. And then he partakes of the fruit and all of these things that are carnal became part of his being and was a predisposition from this point forward. And that's what we get, thanks Adam. Like, we're stuck with this, we're at the bottom of this, uh, at the bottom of this seesaw, and it's now welded to the floor. So everything for us to, to, to become spiritual is an uphill climb, it's unnatural for us. We have to be unnatural if we want to achieve spirituality. The two are a dichotomy. So, is carnality bad? I see some nods saying yes. Well, the serpent was carnal. So were all the rest of the things that were very good. They were created very good. The serpent was created very good. Did God create evil? God saw everything that he had made and it was all very good. So carnality in and of itself is not a bad thing. Did the, car did the, did the serpent sin? The serpent had no law. You can't transgress if there's no law. Was the serpent punished? Well, yeah, he was. But was it a punishment? The punishment is a moral thing. If he had no law and did no sin, what's the punishment? I think we have to conclude that the serpent was suffered a consequence. It had to happen. There had to be a, a consequence to his action. But if he had no law and couldn't sin, uh, it wasn't a punishment per se in the way we understand it. But there was something that had to happen as a result of what he said. The next question is, did the serpent tell a lie? Everything the serpent said ended up being true. They did see good and evil like God did. They were kind of like gods. The fruit was good. And they didn't die immediately. So in, in, the, in the paradigm of the serpent, they weren't really lies. Because a serpent would have no idea about the idea of, of, um, of perishing. It's not in, this, in the experience of any carnal being at the time. That didn't happen. There was no perishing happening at the time. So as far as the serpent, just some carnal being that is only concerned with eating and drinking and procreation and an advantage to self, all of these things made sense to the serpent. The serpent conveyed that idea to, to Eve, and she was created with the capacity to understand those things. All of those things made sense to her. Yeah, maybe we could know more. Yeah, maybe this fruit would be tasty. This is good, let's do it. And then so as soon as they partook of the fruit, everything changed. And from that point forward, uh, there was this, this chaotic situation um, that, uh, that we've all adopted. <clears throat> so the serpent, uh, being a carnal being, like if a fox comes into, say you say you got a hen house, and a fox comes into the hen house and eats your, eats your hen, it, was the fox evil? No, the fox wasn't evil, the fox was a fox and he likes chicken. You may shoot him. Are you punishing him? No, but you're stopping that behavior. It's, it's, it's the same kind of idea that there's nothing inherently wrong with carnality unless or until it is confined by law. 
And initially, Adam and Eve had this one law that they, they were not to disobey. They breached that law, everything changed. They were initially covered effectively. They had their, 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 their fellowship with God was enabled because they were within law. They were within the parameters of the law. So in that sense, they were covered by law. And as soon as they breached that law, they needed a different covering and that was provided for them ultimately. So the serpent represents carnality, and carnality in and of itself I don't think is a big deal. So just very quickly, because I'm going a little f slower than I thought I was going to be going, um, we go to the situation in the children of Israel were in the wilderness in, in Numbers chapter 20. So I suggest you, you take a look at Numbers chapter 20. This is the wilderness of Zin. Um, the people started complaining about how badly they missed uh, Egypt because Egypt was so great for them. And um, in, in Numbers 20 verse 12 it says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So this is the context of when Moses uh, ends up striking the rock twice, uh, is punished. Uh, we go on and... Um, uh, they try and make a deal with Edom uh, to go through their land. They're not going to eat or drink anything. We're just going to blast through. It's not going to be a problem. Edom says no. And then uh, Aaron ends up dying uh, toward the end of chapter 20. And then we have this situation where the people of Israel do what they had done repeatedly, and that is they started missing this revised history they had of Egypt. They missed the food, they missed the stability, they missed all these different things, and here we are with food again. And we're tired of this manna. Uh, verse uh, 5 of chapter 21, the people spoke against God and Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that the people of Israel died. So they complain about the food. And when's the last time we heard about a serpent? In the garden. Completely attached to the idea of food again. So here we have this theme of food that keeps on showing up. They had food. They had manna. It was life-sustaining. But they, they were getting bored with it. So they get this fiery serpent. And we know what ends up happening. They were supposed to... They were punished, and they got, they got eaten, you know, bitten by the fiery serpent, and so forth. And then uh, Moses puts his serpent on a on a on a, on a pole, and it was. Uh, they were supposed to look on that to understand what had gone on. They were supposed to appreciate the fact that their carnality, their carnal thinking, their uh, focus on the food was problematic and that is why they were punished. That's what this serpent was all about. So when they saw this carnality lifted on a pole, they were supposed to be thinking, that's representative of me. They didn't think that. Ultimately what happens is they started to worship. When we go to uh, uh, Second Kings, they started to worship this object on the pole and it was called Nehushtan. And this is what we do all the time. And this is what the children of Israel did in the Law of Moses. Rather than understanding the symbology of a thing, they started to worship the thing. And it's the same thing we can do with, with all kinds of different things, including the, the memorial service. We can see the thing as being sort of efficacious in and of itself, the substance. It's not that. It's the symbolic stuff. It's the spiritual stuff, not the natural stuff. So I want to be careful here because... I don't want anyone taking this the wrong way. In John chapter 3, we have the most remarkable thing, one of the most remarkable things in the Bible, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. And some of the most profound truths come out of this discussion. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is uh, old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus was trying to teach Nicodemus the same thing that we're exploring together here, and that is the, the dichotomy between flesh and spirit, between temporality and spirituality. 
it was very difficult. Nicodemus looked like a very sincere fellow. And he, was trying, he was trying to get this stuff, trying to understand things. And then Jesus says this incredible thing in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So in what possible way could Jesus have, or would Jesus have, likened himself to the serpent in the wilderness? And I think there's one way and one way only, and that is this, that Jesus had the same stuff that we're stuck with. It was about carnality. Carnality had to be lifted up. There was carnality in the serpent. The serpent said all carnal things. It was a carnal perspective. It was completely contra contradictory to God. That had to be put away. It was put away. And yet people kept going back to it like they did in the wilderness. They wanted the food. They wanted the tangible. They didn't get the fact, you know, when Christ was tempted in the wilderness uh, and, uh, you know, he was hungry. And he properly discerned that it was the word of God. That's what the manna was. It was the word of God. The people in the wilderness just thought, man, it's boring. We want something else to eat. So that was the, that was the difference. So carnality is what Christ was uh, cursed with in the same way that all of us were, are cursed with it. It's, it's what we have to deal with. It has to be put away. So those are the thoughts I wanted to bring us to. Uh, I'm going to take my four minutes from yesterday. Got to do it. Because I'm going to play you something. It's not me speaking, so it's going to be interesting. So here's this other piece, of the additional piece of the thing. We have flesh contrasted to spirit. So we have earth and heaven, dust and breath, and flesh contrasted to spirit. So this next little thing, it's an eight-minute video. And then the reason I want to do it is it expands our mind and prepares us for tomorrow where we're talking about a different dimension, one that we don't live in. And it, to me, is absolutely mind-blowing. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the pictures, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, the distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway, power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole Great Lake. 10 to the fifth meters. The distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds. The day's weather in the Middle West. Ten to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. <coughs> the Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the sun. Followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide into big orbits. That outer orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe with myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. The system shrinks to one bright point in the distance. Our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we know four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16 meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. 
Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus, and some stars are different. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of the jungle. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars. Speed it up just a little bit here. Now we reduce the distance to the final destination by 90% every 10 seconds. Each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin. Crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish and turn. An outer layer of cells. Felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself. A molecule like a long twisted ladder whose runs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angst, we find ourselves right among those atoms. I'll stop it here for a specific reason. Because it's lunchtime. <laughs> But also, does anyone recognize? It's still on. You're the man now. So um, this slide here, I noticed along the trip to outer space and to inner space, one is a picture of both of those situations. Can anyone recognize which one is which? Isn't that incredible? The idea that no matter where you go, you can go as far as you want, you're going to end up with this picture, or you can go as far in as you want, you end up with a, almost an identical picture. <sighs> Mind blowing. So I just wanted to leave you with this because it, it, it's a prelude to tomorrow. Let's eat.